So what I'm thinking about today is uh, what those of you who are kind of new to the Zendo and to the online practice, what is it? What is it that brought you here? That's what I'm curious about. Uh, and why Zen? Thousand things to do. What brought us all here in this physical Zendo and in this online Zendo? Oh, I see someone from Colorado there. And, oh, there's someone from Berkeley. And I seem to be having a little, a few technical problems. Maybe I'm going to change my Dharma talk to technical issues. I've got a tremor now. I can't really click that. Okay. And the instruction is not to move. Thank you. Thank you very much. So what brings us to Zen? What brings us to come together today, either online or here in this place uh, to practice Zen? Uh, maybe we think something's missing in our life. A kind of unfulfilled aspiration. A desire to experience a, a fuller life. Something more connected to wisdom, to clarity. And somehow, those of us who've gathered together today have decided to investigate the Zen way. I don't know how we got here. What made us actually make the move to practice together? Some of us thought about it for years before we actually took a move. I could, I'm in that group. I think I recall I was a student at Berkeley uh, picking up a book of, uh, about Chinese painting and starting to read about Zen. But I don't think I sat down for another 20 years. <laughs> so what is the idea of an ancient Buddha have to do with your life today. So the answer to that, I think, is hiding within this kind of etymological uh, understanding of what Buddha means. Buddha means the one who wakes up. Buddha wakes up. And if we're not awake for our lives, you know, what a tragedy. And why, why Zen? Why would a person turn to Zen? What are the qualities that lead us in that direction? There are many, many wonderful wisdom traditions, many paths that offer us solace and courage and spirit for our lives. So why Zen? That's a big question today. This is, the word Zen actually means meditation. So, John a stillness, implying kind of a quality of mind, chan, dhyana. It kind of also has this quality of heart, what we in the West call heart. There's a, 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 compare, a sense of compassion that is also within this one character, chan. Our deepest feeling sense, our heart. What is it like to return to our heart? Mind, also heart, maybe 
They're not two. Mind and heart, indeed. So we could say that Zen is a way of being in touch with our own wholeness, our self, without the overlay of what has crept up and covered our natural way of being, the way we've been trained, the way our society works, all the shoulds. Without our defensiveness or our offensiveness, we've developed ways to protect ourselves, to defend ourselves. And those very ways often imprison us. What we think of as going to protect us actually prevents us from being present to our life. So when we sit in Zen meditation, we can discover a way of being that has no description. When we're able to let go of all that nervous chatter, <laughs> at least that I'm su subject to, I can just dis discover in myself a kind of deep and quiet way, a stillness, a wisdom that really has no name and no words. That's what's so great about it. So it's not hit and miss meditation, you know, uh, an experience to write home about. <laughs> uh, but it can provide for us a home base. When we sit down, take a posture that suits our body, that we don't have to move a lot around. A home base. Ah. I can be just me, right here. And just me is not just what's in this skin bag. But just me is much greater, much wider. To meditate is how we get there. It's vital to do it every day. Now, it may be hard. Your life may be complex. And yet, if you just take five minutes, say, I, for five minutes, I'm going to stop everything. You may find that you expand that five minutes as you practice more. To practice with a group at least once a week, I think is very important. It, it takes it away from my practice, my Zen, it makes us realize that, oh, we're part of all of this. We're part of all these people. Also, for me, I, I'm not a particularly disciplined person, believe it or not. <laughs> and so practicing with a group was always uh, the way that I knew that I would practice and that would encourage my practice to be with others. And, and you know, when we immerse ourselves in, in a Zen practice, Zen meditation, uh, we get a kind of strength, we derive a strength that allows us to respond authentically to whatever arises in our life. We have that wholeness that we are, and then something comes up from reality around us, and, and that wholeness is able to respond. It's not just all broken apart. When we have a, a visceral feeling of our own agency, our own connection to ourselves and our life, then we're able to freely interact in accord with the circumstances. We're able to, to actually be present and the training is the zazen, the sitting that we do. It teaches us 
to being in our own bodies, in our own minds, and then when reality is around us, we're authentic, we're actually there. It's not a script. So then we can freely laugh or cry. We can dance, struggle, uh, struggle, so is life. All aspects of being. Not constrained by some fractured, hidden sense of ourselves, inhibited, some veneer that isn't really there, but an authentic sense of self. Zen is, is really, in my view, simply about precisely recognizing who we are, each one of us, authentically, who we are. When we take away the layers of conditioning. And recognizing that that who we are is changing constantly, as is everything else. So we don't have to get fixed on this idea of me, but the, the movement, the joy of life. Yentu was an ancient Zen teacher, and uh, he put it this way. There is no other task but to know your own original face. This is called independence. The spirit is clear and free. If you say there is some particular doctrine or hierarchy, you'll be totally cheated. Just look into your own heart. There is a transcendental clarity. Just have no greed and no dependency and you will immediately attain certainty. There is no other task but to know your own original face. This is called independence. The spirit is clear and free. If you say there is some particular doctrine or hierarchy, you'll be totally cheated. See that? Just look into your own heart. There is a transcendental clarity. Just have no greed and no dependency and you will immediately attain a certainty, a realization, a waking up. Seems to me this is so simple, so clear, uncluttered. What Zen keeps teaching us is that we just need to, to be at one, to be intimate with our own heart, with our own heart not what others have told us it ought to be. But to drop the idealization, the structures, and drop into your own, your own being, the most intimate self. So there's this koan, as you can imagine, uh, in the entangling binds uh, that reveals this to me. It's called Sudana goes and gets some medicine. One day, Manjusri ordered Sudana to get some medicine, saying, bring me something that isn't medicine. Sudana searched everywhere, but there was nothing that wasn't medicine. He returned and said, Master, there is nothing that isn't medicine. Then bring me something that is medicine, says Anjusri. Sudana picked up a blade of grass and handed it to Manjusri. Manjusri held up the blade and said to the assembly, this medicine can kill a person or bring a person to life. So it starts with Manjusri asking Sudana to bring me some medicine. He says, I can't find anything that isn't medicine. Then bring me something that is medicine. 
what's going on here? In this, this story, uh, you know, is from uh, in, uh, the Gandavara Sutra, a very famous sutra, and uh, Sudana is in there. <laughs> He's the prototypical seeker who's constantly being sent on these different missions uh, to try to attain true wisdom. Uh, and Sudana means, is the name of the, this, this person's name means child of wealth. Think of yourself as a child of wealth, of what you've inherited. Hmm? And we always, we forget that. We don't think that that's, we're thinking about ourselves and inadequacies, etc. Oh, I'm a child of wealth. So in the story of the Gandavara Sutra, he's already visited 53 teachers. Uh, looking for wisdom. Uh, and he's asking Manjushri, what is healing? How does one heal? So Sudana sends him on this mission to find something that is not medicine. Well, there's, there's the answer right there. Try and find something that is not medicine. Find something that does not help, that does not alleviate the pain or prevent illness, that does not stop suffering. And Sudana returns empty handed. There's nothing that isn't medicine. What does that imply for you? What does that imply for you? It implies for me there is nothing that isn't medicine. Looking throughout the world, looking at our personal experience, we look carefully, we can't find anything that doesn't offer some relief, some path, some remedy. If we look carefully, What kind of mind is so wide, so complete, that no matter what is touched can be viewed as healing and not hurting? What in your life is not healing seen properly, seen through the eyes of healing? And then the question is, how do we develop such a mind? And of course, the Zen way is uncomplicated, plain, ordinary. We have this complicated problem, and then we ask for the, the solution, and it's simple. Sit quietly moment by moment, release our thoughts, our ideas, our structures. Let our discursive mind give it a break. And that mind which serves us so well when we're planning and when we're in action, allow it to rest so that a natural innate clarity can arise. Something that's not subjected to all our rational ideas and thoughts and what we've inherited in our culture, our readings, our thoughts, our education, just something that is natural to us, as natural as a baby who's crying. And you know, being at one with such a way of a sim simplicity allows us to naturally respond with composure and presence to every aspect of life. 
experience our life as medicine, as an opportunity for healing. You know, when something arises, which is a pain in the ass, is this an opportunity for healing? How is this an opportunity for healing? So when Sudana, who had practiced hours and hours of meditation, returns and says, there's nothing that is not medicine. Manjushri said, well, then bring me something that is medicine. And Sudana picks up a blade of grass and hands it to Manjushri. And Manjushri holds the blade of grass up and says, this blade of grass can kill a person or bring a person to life. This blade of grass, simplest, humblest item, single blade of grass, it's like a single grain of sand, a mote of dust. And it can stand for the least significant things in the world. And yet each blade of grass, just as each life lived, is of enormous significance. Your life, your life, your life. And that of all those struggling in the world of enormous significance. So the teaching here is that all, all phenomena can serve as medicine, can heal all phenomena. If the mind is ripe, can heal. Whatever you encounter can heal if the mind is ripe. And that's what the last line brings us back to. This medicine can kill a person or bring a person to life. And, you know, in Zen lore, to kill uh, refers to the dissolving of the false self, of the fixed idea. To kill, to get rid of that fixed idea so that there's a life and movement. To kill is to get rid of the robot self <laughs> that goes around encased in protective covering, acting out of preconceived ideas and habits and negative conditioning. We kill that false self in order to bring to life our more true and intimate self. The self that can sit and quietly settle the mind. The self that has met and recognized its demons. And that self has been brought to life through your meditation. And it's that self that moves through the world with the presence of mind and awareness. It doesn't look like our idea of a meditative mind, you know, it doesn't move slowly like in a trance, <laughs> but it's energetic and active and alive, involved with the workings of the world. To bring a person to life brings us out of our dream and into the life that's really in front of us. Vibrant, with appropriate response. If we can let go of the robot, the idea of who we are and being who we are. So what does Zen have to do with it? 
our approach is to find our center. Find out where are the riches that have always been right here. Our innate wisdom, our innate wealth, our innate abundance to experience life from that place is a joy. So to conclude with, I'm going to read you a verse I wrote the other day. When I began to think of the question, why Zen? He asks me, why Zen? Clear blue sky, sunlight glancing off the falling leaves. The little black-headed chickadees whistles. My life so clear, so direct. Gratitude for this mind moment. <laughs>